the simile of the snake tonight and you haven't heard that one <clears throat> about this monk Arita who said to himself and to the people that he crossed that the Buddha's teaching, as he understood it, that there was no problem with what were called distractions and hindrances, and especially sensual distractions, that one could indulge in them as much as they wanted. And that actually wasn't a problem in the Buddha's teaching. <laughs> and pretty quick he gets corrected. He is suggested and encouraged by his friends and companions in the holy life, the other monks, the monastic community, to straighten his view, to change his view, to not misrepresent the Buddha's teaching. Because the first factor of the first jhana, the first jhana meditation, is so viviche wa kamehi, so he, viviche wa letting go or detached, disengaged, e wa quiet or thus. Kamehi. Kame is senses. And more specifically, sense engagement. Sensuality. Sense. Desires. Attractions. Um, doesn't make much sense. Uh, um, in the order it's it's in, but we can figure out through that. So that's the first line of the first jhana. So what the Buddha called meditation, jhana. Um, that's what it started with. Except in some suttas, like the Potapada, the states of consciousness, the gladness, the collectedness sequence is connected with the first jhana. So there's no difference, like it's all in the same paragraph, there's no period in between, there's this. <coughs> That's how a person gets into the first jhana, Thru from that gladness to collectedness, and then that means disengaging from the senses. I like disengaging from the senses better than secluded from sensual pleasures. To, to me, that makes more sense because it's more, you know, what you do with senses, you engage in them. Like sensual pleasures, sensual desires, uh, yes, it's, that's what it is, really, yes. But... Um, To me, it resonates way more when I think of it uh, as, uh, you know, engaging. So, so it's obviously a quite v important topic uh, or aspect in the teaching to understand. Is that actually no? <laughs> you know, like the, the <laughs> there's sensual engagement, and there's meditation and they are two different things and this sutta goes at length uh, not at explaining this exactly but the Buddha takes that as an occasion to really make sure that the monks really understand what he's teaching and it's an amazing discourse we have um, one of the main uh, 
discourse where the simile of the raft is talked about. Very beautiful. And it goes into anatta, the features of selflessness. We'll dive into that into also. And much more. <laughs> so I think that's a good enough introduction. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. Now on that occasion, a pernicious view had arisen in the bhikkhu named Aritta, formerly of the vulture killers, thus. As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. So no Buddha, what you're saying is not right. Several bhikkhus, having heard about this, went to the bhikkhu Arita and asked him, Friend Arita, is it true that such a pernicious view has arisen in you? Exactly so, friends, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. The word engage actually is used here, so that's quite lovely. Then these monks, desiring to detach him from that pernicious view, to help him, pressed and questioned and cross-questioned him thus, Friend Arita, do not say so. Do not misrepresent the Blessed One. It is not good to misrepresent the Blessed One. The Blessed One would not speak thus. For in many ways, he has stated how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. The Blessed One has stated that sensual engagement pleasures provide little gratification much trouble and despair, and that the danger in them is still more. So here we have pretty clear. <laughs> with the simile of the skeleton, with the simile of the piece of meat, with the simile of the grass torch, and now, now I can read this sutta because you've heard these similes now. <laughs> so you're familiar with those and that's that's nice because the sutta kind of goes beyond that now the simile of the pit of coals the simile of the dream with the simile of borrowed goods with the simile of fruits on a tree with the simile of the butcher's knife and the block with the simile of the sword stake, with the simile of the snake's head. I like that they're really driving it in, you know? <laughs> it's like, no, no, you don't remember all these similes, you know? <laughs> it's like, what were you doing when he was talking about that? The Blessed One has stated that sensual engagement provides little gratification, m much trouble and despair, and that the danger in them is still more. Yet, although pressed and questioned and cross-questioned by the monks, the bhikkhu arita formerly of their vultures killers, still obstinately adhered to that pernicious view and continued to insist upon it. Now sometimes it's interesting what people are doing in there, <laughs> what they're thinking. Since the monks were unable to detach him from that pernicious view, they went to the Blessed One and after paying homage to him, now they're just saying what happened. Uh, there's a lot of repetitive things in there. So uh, the, the Buddha 
calls on Arita and just he says just tell him to come I want to speak to him the teacher calls you friend Arita yes friend he replied and went to the blessed one Arita is it true that the following pernicious view has arisen in you as I understand the Dhamma taught by the blessed one those things called obstructions are not able to obstruct one who engages in them exactly so venerable sir as I understand the Dhamma taught by the blessed one those obstructions cannot obstruct <laughs> and the Buddha replies misguided man to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in such a way misguided man have I not stated in many ways how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them I have stated that sensual engagement provide little satisfaction much trouble and despair and that the danger in them is still more with the simile of the skeleton with the simile of the piece of meat the simile of the grass torch of the pit of coals of the dream the simile of borrowed goods the simile of the fruits on a tree <clears throat> the simile of the butcher's knife and the block the simile of the sword stake the simile of the snake's head I have stated that sensual indulgence provides little gratification much trouble and despair and that the danger in them is still more but you misguided man by your wrong grasp have misrepresented us injured yourself and stored up much demerit for this will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time trouble sometimes the way it's translated is seems a bit harsh like how the Buddha speaks <coughs> um, I don't think the Buddha ever spoke harshly so I try to change it as I go if I can to make it sound a bit more clement I don't think the Buddha really uh, cared he just had compassion but that person was you know to go that far was probably quite badly intentioned you know, so <coughs> The rebuke is kind of justified, I think. <laughs> as far as rebukes go with the Buddha. <coughs> then the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Bhikkhus, what do you think? Has this Bhikkhu Arita, formerly of the vulture killers, kindled even a spark of wisdom in this Dhamma and discipline? How could he, Venerable Sir, no Venerable Sir, Bhante? When this was said, the Bhikkhu Arita, formerly of the vulture killers, sat silent, dismayed, with shoulders drooping and head down, glum, and without response. Then, knowing this, the Blessed One told, told him, Misguided man, you will be recognized by your own pernicious view. I will question the bhikkhus on this matter. And now he's, he's actually going to show him that that's not his teaching, but he's not going to teach it. He's going to ask everybody else to show how, you know, how far it's not right, how far it's not true. So it's quite of an interesting way that he had. And he is basically you will recognize your own view when I ask everybody else you will understand and that's actually he's not doing anything he's just that person is getting the karma that they've created 
So he doesn't have to do anything because that's just the Dharma, how, how it works. <coughs> then he said, Monks, do you understand the Dhamma taught by me as this bhikkhu Arita does when by his wrong grasp he misrepresents us, injures himself, and stores up much demerit? No, Bhante, for in many ways the Blessed One has stated how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them in the meditation the obstruct the blessed one has stated that sensual engagement provides little satisfaction and then goes on through the whole repetition of the similes which I won't do good monks sadhu that's what it actually is in Pali sadhu bhikkhus bhikkhave in fact it is good that you understand the Dhamma taught by me thus, for in many ways I have stated how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. I have stated that sensual engagement provides little satisfaction, much trouble and despair, and that the danger in them is still more with the simile of the skeleton, the simile, simile, simile. Monks, that one can engage in sensual pleasures without sensual desires, without perceptions of sensual desire, without thoughts of sensual desire, that is impossible. And that's very interesting, especially when people think that they've attained very lofty stages of awakening and then you see them indulging in those things and then that is just telling you a very good um, insight on what the true state of affair can be because there's no <laughs> there's no the Buddha makes it so clear here how you know if you that doesn't mean you know you don't live in a way to live in comfort but I mean in using the things of the senses as entertainment distraction finding happiness in that it's just impossible that you won't be doing that because of sin of desire <laughs> so it's just um, I like this statement a very short statement because it makes it very clear <laughs> underlines the whole thing and the Buddha when he spoke especially important discourses he said to apply the mind like a matter of vital concern <laughs> like to really really give all your attention to and then you you might have to um, do that for the rest of the sutta because it's quite uh, try to try to stay <laughs> try to stay with it because um, It's a. Uh, it's quite a. Uh, it's quite an elaborate teaching, not very complicated, but just very uh, quite profound if we listen to it or give proper attention. Now the simile of the snake. Here, monks, some misguided men learn the Dhamma discourses, stanzas, expositions, verses, exclamations, sayings, birth stories, marvels, and answers to questions. But having learned the Dhamma, they do not examine the meaning of those teachings with wisdom. 
not examining the meaning of those teachings with wisdom, they do not gain a reflective acceptance of them in your own experience directly. Instead, they learn the Dhamma only for the sake of criticizing others and for winning debates. And they do not experience the good for the sake of which they learn the Dhamma. Those teachings being wrongly grasped by them conduce to their harm and suffering for a long time. Why is that? Because of the wrong grasp. Of those teachings it's like when people come and they don't really listen they don't really give ear and without even interrupting in the Dhamma or you know um, trying to make a point or something in fact trying to uh, like treating the Dhamma like it's a matter of philosoph uh, philosophical debates it's not <laughs> it's not at all we're not here to debate about things we're here to actually learn and experience the goodness of the Dhamma and I'm not interested in philosophical debates <laughs> when we have gatherings. I'm only interested in the Dhamma and people that are serious about it, that want to actually experience it, not argue. I don't care about arguing. I don't want to argue with people. <laughs> Is you either here because you want to hear it or not <laughs> I, I have nothing to prove to people and that's that's what the Buddha did he didn't care that people he wanted people to be happy he wanted to help them in a compassionate way but this Dhamma is not for debating it's to be humble to actually practice. Suppose a man needing a snake, oh. seeking a snake, wandering in search of a snake, saw a large snake and grasped, grasped its coils and its tail. It would turn back on him and bite his hand or arm or any other one of his limbs. And because of that, one would come to death or deadly suffering. Why is that? Because of his wrong grasp of the snake. So here some misguided men learn the Dhamma and because of the wrong grasp of the teaching. So he repeats that. Here monks, some clansmen learn the Dhamma discourses Stanzas, exposition, verses, exclamations, saying, birth stories, marvels, answers to questions. And here we have a nice list of what probably the earliest, like directly from the earliest sayings, what, how the Buddhist teaching was probably preserved in the earliest days. These little, all these um, subjects. And having learned the Dhamma, they examine the meaning of those teachings with wisdom. Examining the meaning of those teachings with wisdom, they gain a reflective acceptance of them. They do not learn the Dhamma for the sake of critici criticizing others and for winning in debates, and they experience the good for the sake of which they learn the Dhamma. See, this is a kind of a process of learning that the Buddha gave. You go and you pay, you pay respect, just meaning you, 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 and then you give ear to a teacher. And then you reflect upon the teaching. Then you recite them verbally. You remember them. And you 
you practice in accordance with the Dhamma and then you understand that's how usually you would say that those teachings being rightly grasped by them conduce to their welfare and happiness for a long time why is that because of the right grasp at those teachings suppose a man needing a snake seeking a snake wandering in search of a snake saw a large snake and caught it rightly with a cleft stick and having done so grasped it rightly by the neck then although the snake might wrap its coils around his heart his hand his hand or his arm or his limbs still he would not come to death and deadly suffering because of that why is that because of his right grasp of the snake so too a clansman learned the Dhamma reflects upon it why is that because of the right grasp at those teachings so, therefore monks when you understand the meaning of my statements remember it accordingly and when you do not understand the meaning of my statements then ask either me about it or those bhikkhus who are wise it's always seeing things as they are so when you know you know when you don't know you don't know and then you ask <laughs> or you remember it the way it is <laughs> and if you don't remember it the way it is you ask how is it <laughs> how did how did the buddha say it because now the simile of the raft because i shall now show you how the dhamma is similar to a raft being for the purpose of crossing over not for the purpose of grasping listen and attend closely to what i shall say yes venerable sir the blessed one said this monks suppose a man in the course of a journey saw a great expanse of water whose near shore was dangerous and fearful and whose further shore was safe and free from fear but there was no ferry boat or bridge for going to the far shore then he thought there is this great expanse of water whose near shore is dangerous and fearful and whose further shore is safe and free from fear but there is no ferry boat suppose I collect grass twigs branches and leaves and bind them together into a raft and supported by the raft making an effort with my hands and feet I got safely across to the far shore and then the man collects collected grass twigs branches leaves and bound them together into a raft and crossed over to the far shore then when he had gotten across and had care and had arrived at the far shore he might think thus this ra this raft has been very helpful to me since supported by it and making an effort by my with my hands and feet I got safely across to the far shore suppose I were to hoist it on my head or load it on my shoulders and then go wherever I want now monks what do you think by doing so would that man be doing what should be done with the raft no Bhante by doing what would that man be doing what should be done with the raft here monks when that man got across and had arrived to the far far shore he might think thus this raft has been very helpful to me since supported by it making an effort I got safely across to the far shore suppose I were to haul it on to dry land or to set it adrift in the water and then go wherever I want now monks it is by so doing that that man would be doing what should be done with the raft 
So I have shown you how the Dhamma is similar to a raft being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping. Monks, when you know the Dhamma to be similar to a raft, you should abandon even the teachings. How much more so things contrary to the teachings? Monks, there are these six standpoints for views. What are the six? Here, monks, a non-taught, ordinary person who has no regard for the noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, who has no regard for the tr for true for true man, sapurisa. This this is the liberated people. And is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma. Regards material form thus, material form. And now we have the five aggregates. This is mine. This I am. This is myself. He regards sensations thus. This is mine. This I am. This is myself. He regards perception thus. This is mine. This I am. This is myself. He regards f formations thus. This is mine. This I am. This is myself. He regards what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, encountered, sought, mentally pondered upon. Thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. And this standpoint for views, namely, that which is the self is the world. After death, I shall be permanent everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. This too he regards thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. Monks, a well-taught, noble disciple who has regard for the noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in the noble Dhamma, who has regard for true men and women, and is skilled and disciplined in their Dhamma, regards material form thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. He regards sensations thus this is not mine this I am not this is not myself he regards perception thus this is not mine this I am not this is not myself he regards formations thus mental formations this is not mine this I am not this is not myself he regards what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, encountered, sought, mentally pondered upon, thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself, it thinks. <laughs> and this standpoint for views, namely, that which is the self is the world. After death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. This too he regards thus, this is not mine, this is not myself. Since one regards them thus, one is not agitated about what is non-existent. When this was said, 
A certain monk asked the Blessed One, Venerable Sir Bhante, Can there be agitation about what is non-existent externally? One way you could say that is, is there agitation about what does not happen externally or what is not existent? There can be monks. Here, monks, someone thinks, alas, I had it. Alas, I have it no longer. Alas, may I have it. Alas, I do not get it. Then he sorrows, grieves, and laments. He weeps, beating his breast, and becomes distraught. That is how there is agitation about what is non-existent externally, when things don't happen externally. Venerable Sir Bhante, can there be no agitation about what is, what doesn't happen externally? Would you like the chair? There can be monks. Here someone does not think, Alas, I had it. Alas, I have it no longer. Alas, may I have it. Alas, I do not get it. Then he does not sorrow. <laughs> Grieve and lament. He does not weep, beating one's breast and become distraught. That is how there is no agitation about what is not existent externally. Venerable Sir, can there be agitation about what is non-existent internally? There can be monks. Here, monks, someone has the view that which is the self is the world. After death I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. He hears the Tathagata, or the uh, disciple of the Tathagata, the Buddha, teaching the Dhamma for the elimination of all standpoints, decisions, obsessions, adherences, and underlying tendencies, for the stilling of all formations, for the relinquishing of all attachments, for the destruction of craving, for calm, cessation, and nibbana. He thinks thus, so I shall be annihilated, so I shall perish, so I shall be no more. Then he sorrows, grieves, and laments, weeps, beating one's breast, and become distraught. That is how there is agitation about what is non-existent internally. Venerable Sir, and that, that arches backward, that very point that is very touchy with the teaching of Anatta, is that it actually brings a lot of fear in people sometimes, but it's because they don't understand. It's not, they, they're not there yet. You can't just teach anatta any way you want without preliminary, you know, this is monk teaching, you know. So those people who can hear that, they're the people that are ready, you know. They're the people that have enough uh, of a base knowledge. That's why I don't talk about it much in the beginning, because it's quite profound and people can have a lot of attachment to that view <laughs> or you know be scared of it sounds unrealistic but the buddha actually answers that later bante can there be no agitation about what is non-existent inter ex internally there can be monks here someone does not have the view that which is the self is the world, and I shall endure as long as eternity. He hears the Dhamma, 
the Tathagata or disciple of the Tathagata, teaching the Dhamma for the elimination of all standpoints, decisions, obsessions, adherences, and underlying tendencies, for the stilling of all formations, for the relinquishing of all attachments, for the destruction of craving, calm, cessation, Nibbana. And he does not think thus, so I shall be annihilated, so I shall perish, so I shall be no more. Then he does not sorrow, grieve, and lament about what is non-existent internally, about something that is not. It's dogma. And I think that is quite a wonderful paragraph where the Buddha really tells us what his teaching is about relinquishing all views. Even the views of the teaching is a view which you have to relinquish. We have to understand that. If the teaching is not for arguing, the teaching is to reach Nibbana. You don't put the raft on your head. You keep it under you and you paddle and you stay humble. <laughs> not you, but everybody. <laughs> we stay humble. We don't hoist it up on our heads. And like you say, you didn't think there was going to be more joy and more better. But it just gets better and better and better. <laughs> the thing is that we just need time and practice and we get to see how profound the happiness of that teaching is. It's hard to understand, especially at first. Relinquishing all views is actually extremely liberating just knowing that is like right <laughs> then then that gives you a very a lot of power to understand how the mind works how the liberation of the mind works the true liberation of the mind Monks, you may well acquire that possession that is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, and that might endure as long as eternity. But do you see any such possession, monk? No, Bhante, good monks, I too do not see any such possession that is permanent, everlasting eternal, not subject to change, and that might endure as long as eternity. Monks, you may well cling to a doctrine of self that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who clings to it. But do you see any such doctrine of self, monks? That's quite profound, but... No, Bhante, good monks, I too do not see any doctrine of self that would not arouse sorrow and pain in one who clings to it. That's all it can happen because it's bound to go. The sooner we understand that, the better we're off. Monks, you may well take as you may well take as a support that view that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who takes it as a support. Any view. Support your mind. Any view. But do you see any such support of views, monks? No, Bhante. Good monks, I too do not see any support of views that would not arouse trouble.
disturbance. Monks, there being a self, would there be for me what belongs to a self? Yes, Bhante. Or there being what belongs to a self, would there be for me a self? Yes, Bhante. Monks, since a self and what belongs to a self are not apprehended as true and established, then this standpoint for views, namely, that which is the self is the world, and after death I shall be everlasting, would it not be an utterly and completely foolish teaching? What else could it be, Bhante? Monks, what do you think? Is material form permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Bhante. And what is impermanent? Is it pleasant or unpleasant? It is unpleasant, Bhante. Is what is unpleasant impermanent and subject to change, fit to be regarded as, this is mine, this is myself? This I am. No, Bhante. Monks, what do you think? Are sensations permanent or impermanent? They are impermanent, Bhante. Is what is impermanent pleasant or unpleasant? It is unpleasant, Bhante. Is what is impermanent unpleasant, subject to change? fit to be regarded thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, Bhante. Monks, is perception permanent or impermanent? It is impermanent, Bhante. Is what is impermanent pleasant or unpleasant? It is unpleasant, Bhante. Is what is impermanent, unpleasant, and subject to change, fit to be regarded as, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, Bhante. Are mental constructs permanent or impermanent? They are impermanent, Bhante. Is what is impermanent pleasant or unpleasant? It is unpleasant, Bhante. Is what is impermanent, unpleasant, and subject to change, fit to be regarded as, this is mine, this I am, this is myself? No, Bhante. Is consciousness permanent or impermanent? It is impermanent, Bhante. Is what is impermanent pleasant or unpleasant? It is unpleasant, Bhante. Is what is impermanent unpleasant and subject to change fit to be regarded as this is mine, this I am, this is myself? No, Bhante. Therefore, monks, any kind of material form, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all material forms should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Any kind of sensations, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all sensations should be seen as they actually are with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine. This is not myself. This I am not. Any kind of perception, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, 
far or near. All material form should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Any kind of mental construct, whatever, past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all mental constructs should be seen as they actually are. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Any kind of consciousness, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior, superior, far or near, name it. All consciousness should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. It's just arising and passing away. And even if you tell it to stop, it doesn't stop. It's there. Can you tell your mind to enter Niroda here now? No? Because it's hard? <laughs> It's hard in, the, in a good way. The path is blissful when we practice properly. But the truth is, consciousness, we don't have con full control over it. We think that we do. But the deeper we go, we just see that it's just stuff rising, passing away. Consciousness to be conscious, there needs to be an object. There needs to be something to be conscious of. <laughs> Otherwise, it doesn't have the support. It doesn't arise. And when we take that support away, then we understand what consciousness is, what name and form is, what all concepts are. Just standpoints, views. And we understand Naroda. And these are on the same notes. By practicing meditation, by going there all the way, by calming the mind, letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go. Of course, I'm not talking about the whole path of development with joy and all these things, but at that point, the end, letting go, letting go, letting go. The opening gets bigger. The impression on the mind is more established. The understanding through direct experience becomes integrated. And these words do the same thing. They create the right pattern, the right coding in the mind that will nourish that understanding. So it's both ways. You keep jhana, jhana, jhana. <laughs> and then understanding another word for jhana understanding understanding deeper levels of letting go of release and then hearing the dharma making that imprint on the mind so we direct the mind in the right way all the time seeing thus monks a well-taught noble disciple becomes disengaged with material form, disengaged with sensation, disengaged with perception, disengaged with mental constructs, 
disengaged with consciousness. Being disengaged, one becomes calm. Through calm, one's mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge it is liberated. See, that's only when it gets liberated. You know, some people, they get attached with the words and they think, oh yeah, this is the path. I know that path. But actually, when it's liberated, there is the knowledge. It is liberated. That's how you know. Not the words. <laughs> One understands the birth of unwholesome states are destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of conceit. Monks, this monk is called one whose crossbar has been lifted, whose trench has been filled whose pillar has been uprooted, one who has no bolt, a noble one whose banner is lowered, whose burden is lowered, who is unfettered. And how is a monk one whose crossbar has been lifted here the monk has abandoned ignorance, cut it off at the root, made it like a palm stump, done away with it so that it no longer subject to future arising. And how is a monk, one whose trench has been filled? Here the monk has abandoned the round of rebirths that brings renewed being has cut it off at the root, made it like a palm stump. There is no longer subject to future arising. That is how the monk is one whose trench has been filled. And how is the monk one whose spiller has been uprooted? Here a monk has abandoned craving, cut it off at the root, made it like a palm stump, so that it no longer subject to future arising. That is how the monk is one whose pillar has been uprooted. And how is the monk one who has no bolt? Here a monk has abandoned the five lower fetters that are keeping us tied. Cut, off, cut them off at the root so that they are no longer subject to future arising. That is how the monk is one who has no bolt. And how is the monk a noble one whose banner is lowered, whose burden is lowered, and who is unfettered? Here a monk has abandoned the conceit I am cut it off at the root, made it like a palm stump, done away with it, <clears throat> so that it is no longer subject to future arising. That is how a monk is a noble one whose banner is lowered, whose burden is lowered, who is unfettered. Monks, when the gods with Indra, with Brahma and Pajapati seek a monk, who is thus liberated in mind, they do not find anything of which they could say. The consciousness of one thus gone is supported by this. Why is that? One thus gone, I say, is untraceable here and now. misrepresenting the Buddha now. So saying, monks, so proclaiming, I have been baselessly, vainly, falsely, and wrongly misrepresented by some teachers and Brahmins thus. The recluse Gotama is one who leads astray. 
he teaches the annihilation, the destruction, the extermination of existing beings. As I am not, as I do not proclaim. That's why sometimes people think that of Buddhism, but that's not right. And this talk, I would say that talk on a Sunday, <laughs> you know. So there's a time for this kind of teaching. Monks, both formerly and now, what I teach is unhappiness and the cessation of unhappiness. If others abuse, revile, scold and harass the Tathagata for that, the Tathagata on that account feels no annoyance, no bitterness or dejection of the heart. And if others honor, respect, revere and venerate the Tathagata for that, the Tathagata on that account feels no delight joy or elation of the heart. If others honor, respect, revere and venerate the Tathagata for that, the Tathagata on that occasion thinks thus, they perform such services as these for me in regard to this which earlier was fully understood. Therefore, monks, if others abuse, revile, scold, and harass you, on that account you should not entertain any annoyance, bitterness, or dejection. And if others honor, respect, revere, and venerate you on that account, you should not entertain any delight, joy, or elation. If others do so on that account, you should think thus. They perform such services as these for us in regards to which, to this which earlier was fully understood. It is for the Dhamma that people would show respect or things like that. So he's telling the monks, don't get a big head, don't take it personal. They just do that because they see the goodness of the Dhamma, which was discovered by the Buddha in the first place. We're getting it, we're practicing it. People feel inspired. When it's not personal, when they show respect, they show special um, honor or things like that. Therefore, monks, whatever is not yours, abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. What is it that is not yours? Material form is not yours. Abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Sensations are not yours. Let them go. When you, when you have abandoned them, that will lead to your happiness and welfare for a long time. Perception is not yours. Abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead for your welfare and happiness for a long time. Mental constructs are not yours. Abandon them. When you abandon them, this will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Consciousness is not yours. Abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Monks, what do you think? 
If people carried off the grass, sticks, branches, and leaves of this jata, jata's grove, or burned them, or did whatever they liked with them, would you think people are carrying us off, or burning us, or doing whatever they want with us? No, Bhante. Why not? Because that is neither our self nor what belongs to our self. So too, monks, whatever is not yours, abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Monks, this Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, open, evident, and free of patchwork. In this Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear, open, evident, and free of patchwork, there is no future realm for manifestation in the case of those bhikkhus who are arahants with influxes destroyed distractions destroyed, who have lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached their own goal, destroyed the fetters of being, and are completely emancipated through final knowledge. This is the Arahat. He's ending with all the noble peoples. This is the grand finale. Monks, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, open, evident, and free of patchwork. In the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus, those monks who, are, uh, who have abandoned the five lower fetters are all due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final Nibbāna without ever returning from that world. Non-return. Monks, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, open, evident, and free of patchwork. In the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear, those monks who have abandoned three fetters and attenuated lust, hate, and delusion are all once returners. Returning once to this world, they make an end of problems. Monks, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear open, evident, free of patchwork. In the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus, those monks who have abandoned three fetters are all stream enterers, no longer subject to perdition, bound for deliverance and headed for enlightenment. Monks, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear open, evident, free from patchwork. In the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus, those monks who are Dhamma followers or faith followers are all headed for enlightenment. Monks, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, evident, and free of patchwork. In the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus, those who have sufficient faith in me, sufficient love for me, are all headed for heaven. <laughs> That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words.
Dukkha patta chani dukkha Bhaya patta chani bhaya Soka patta chani soka Hantu sabbe pipani no Irang no punyang sabbe satta numo dantu Sabba sampatti siddhya Aga satta chabu matta Deva naga mahiddika Punyang tanga numo ritva Chirang rakkantu buddha sasasana May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers share these merits of ours. May belong protect the Buddha Sasana Sah.